all the bullshit you go through is always meant to be as long as you don't quit. Songwriter Saturday. Hi, I'm Kim and welcome to Songwriter Saturday. Today I'm joined by Justin Trancer, formerly the front person of glam punk band Semi Precious Weapons. Justin is now one of the most prolific songwriters of their generation, penning hits with and for everyone from Justin Bieber to Gwen Stefani, Selena Gomez to Halsey, Julia Michaels, and more. We talk about what writing with those artists is like and how going for the jugular in your lyrics and speaking your truth always creates the most resonant art. Justin Trancer, welcome to Songwriter Saturday. Hello, thank you for having me. I wanted to start by taking it right back to Semi-Precious Weapons. Fun. During that period of, of being in Semi-Precious Weapons, you know, you, you, there was, what, three labels, records. It was tumultuous, to say the least. Could you talk a little bit about that time and kind of what you learned from that era in your career? I learned really about the beauty of collaboration, learned about the how what it feels like to be on the road, learned what the expectations from record labels are. For the 10th time in my life, learned about perseverance. Keep fucking fighting the good fight if this is what you want. Knowing what artists have to go through on the road, knowing what artists have to go through in terms of what their label's asking for, what their management's asking for, decoding, all of like the bullshit A&R lingo really prepared me for the second half of my career, which was as a professional songwriter. I'm so grateful for those years. As sort of the only queer person in Semi Precious Weapons and then having labels kind of tell you to tone it down, what sort of advice do you have for songwriters or artists who are maybe coming up against the same issues? Because those issues are not, you know, they haven't completely gone away. Those issues are still here, you know, it, there's definitely a lot to celebrate in, in, in how far we have come. I mean, looking right now, the biggest song in the world right now is Sam Smith, Kim Precious, Unholy. You know, non-binary person and a trans person singing the biggest song in the world together. There are definitely huge things to celebrate, but you know, Sam and I um, go way back. Sam was a big fan of um, my band. And then, of course, our paths have crossed now on, on this side of the business. And early in Sam's career, they were told the same things. And they were told the music can't be too dance and the look can't be too this. With Sam's success, now they can make the music they want to. And they can come out as non-binary and they can wear whatever fierce outfits they want to wear on their Instagram. But for new artists, they're definitely still experiencing the same thing. And I would just say, if you create a world of fan base online that is so passionate um, and that loves you, you hold the power. Build the, the biggest fan base and the biggest world for yourself on your own so that dumb assholes, bigots can't control your destiny. Let's rewind to 2013 and correct me if I'm wrong, but in 2013, did you say that you weren't $12,000 a for that entire year? Yeah, 2013 I made 12 grand for the entire year. And it was a turning point for you. I mean, that was also the year where you sort of opened your mind up to writing for and with other people. Yeah, that was the year. So when the, the last like two years of the band, we made an album with Tricky Stewart, who's a fucking genius and one of the sweetest people alive. We were so excited to work with him because the production on, on all of his songs is just so smart and elevated and through him, a couple songs that I that had written for the band, he was like, I fucking love this song, but it's it's a step too pop for the band. What about if I play this song for Rihanna? Or what if I play this song for this artist or whatever? No cuts ever came from that. Nothing ever, we didn't get a cut from it, but it did sort of open my mind to like, all right, well, if Tricky Stewart, who's co-written and co-produced some of the best songs in the last 10 years, if he thinks this is something I'm capable of doing, I should look into this. Like, so I went to work fucking hard. And uh, I take writing very seriously. Uh, I take lyrics extremely seriously, but I also take like creating a safe, positive environment in the writing room very seriously. Mm -hmm. For the most part, almost every session I did they, I was asked to come back immediately and this person, oh, and we, the, the producer loved Justin so much, we'd love to have the producer and Justin do this artist. And it, it, it uh, uh, luckily, thank, thank Marilyn Monroe, it all went like very quickly 
in that area for the first time in my life of my music career, something went quickly. The fact that you kind of didn't write, um, you didn't write songs with other people from the ages of what, 16 to 32 or something. And then yeah. you're suddenly entering these rooms where you're creating yeah. a safe space, but you're, you're having to collaborate instantaneously and intimately. I mean, how did you leap straight into that? Did you feel immediately at home? It was such a relief to think about, like, to not think about myself. <laughs> like, in the band, it's like, all right, how am I going to perform this? How's it going to feel on stage? What am I going to wear for a song like this? If it was just me and songwriters and no artists in the room, it was just like, let's just write the best song possible. Like, who cares? And then if it was the artist in the room, once you've played enough shows and this and that, you kind of lose perspective of your original vision of being whatever your artist's vision is. And so to be able to work with artists and be like, all right, I've known of you for this many years or that many years. I think I, I can like help you figure out what's the next step because I can see from the outside and you can't because you are that right. person. All those moments of my life had led up to do this. Um, and so I always think it's all meant to be like all the bullshit you go through is always meant to be as long as you don't quit. I love this notion of like the more specific you are, the more universal a lyric can actually be. Can you talk yes. a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm like a firm believer that verses are for the super fans, right? And that's where you need to like be so specific. You need to tell as much of your truth whether that's fun truth, sexy truth, emotional truth, dark truth, whatever that truth is for the song, you, I, need, I need as much of that as humanly possible. Um, so that when you say the core, when you get to the chorus that is probably for the most part, especially in things that end up on pop radio, for the most part is gonna be a little more broad. That those broad lyrics of the chorus though, for the people who are really listening, for the real music fans, the real super fans, or the real lyric fans, whatever you might be, that that chorus hits you in a, real, in a, a much deeper way. So the passive listener can just hear, I'm bad at love, ooh, ooh, passively hear that. The aggressive listener, <laughs> the, the detailed listener, hears all these stories of Halsey's life all these amazing, amazing details that come right from her brain, right from her life. Um, then all of a sudden, oh my God, I'm bad at love. Like you can see the different images and it's like watching a great movie. Like if the story is so specific, you're going to connect so deeply to those characters. So those little details can make something feel so big or Justin Bieber's sorry. You know, like the, the details in the verses about this very specific relationship. Then when you hear, is it too late now to say sorry? For the passive listener, oh, it's, an, it's a breakup apology song. For the detailed listener, like, oh my God, they went through this and they went through that. And, you know, there's two sides to the story and there's, there's the whole thing. So it's, it's my favorite, I don't want to call it a trick because arts, trick is a negative term. It's my favorite tool to use of like detailed verses, broad chorus. Gotcha. And, you, and Gwen Stefani, you say, is very, very good at these details. Uh, the details are insane. If it is not happening to her in that moment, don't you dare put it in the fucking song. Like, not, like, won't happen. Like, you know, oh, you think of a cool rhyme and you're like, oh, well, you know, it's the second verse. Like, uh, that just sounds awesome, right? It sounds awesome. And she's like, no, that's not What's happening? I want people to feel exactly what I'm feeling. And then you go back and you listen to something like Holla Back Girl, which seems like a party song. Yeah. You listen to those details and she is upset. Like, She's when like, I will cut you. And it's like, so as a fan, after listening, working with her, I listen back and I'm like, oh my God. But listening back to the details of what she talks about, um, unbelievable. Unbelievable. This is a tough question and maybe unanswerable, but like, who would you say have you had the most gratifying and rich songwriting partnership with? Working with Dan Reynolds from Imagine Dragons has been really special because um, 
it's more of like a personal thing to to see him basically become this insane LGBTQ ally, um, you know, growing up Mormon, um, knowing the issues that LGBTQ people who are raised Mormon face and knowing the suicide rates that they face to watch Dan, like literally make it his life's work to like save queer people in the Mormon community. It's been a really unbelievable thing to watch someone use their platform uh, so specifically, <laughs> like to know that I'm a, I am a part of that, that the conversations he and I had um, were a small part of inspiring this mission. Um, wrong word to use for a Mormon person to, to inspire this, to inspire this journey <laughs> yeah. he has gone on. Um, it's pretty fucking cool. And we wrote Believer. Um, it was the second song I ever wrote with him. Um, and we wrote it, um, and it was in the heat of the Hillary Clinton Trump election cycle, the campaigning cycle. Um, and very fucking stressful time for anyone who cares about other people and for anyone who cares about marginalized people. There was someone at the studio who was very uh, racist and awful um, and said some crazy shit and I, I got in a fight with this employee at the, at the recording studio we were working at. Um, and Dan was like, I think, I think, I think I should, I should probably ask that person to leave, right? And I was like, listen, like, I have faced this shit my whole life, you know? I look normal-ish now, um, but there was years of six inch heels and full makeup and facing violence on the street every single day. And when I go out, I still dress like that. I just, I'm too tired to do it every day. Um, but I'm like, Dan, I've been through this a bunch. Like, I don't fucking care. I've had these fights too many times, sadly. And he's like, no, fuck that. That guy should leave. He should, he should never come back here ever again. Um, and so like that, the stress of the election and the stress of this in incident in the studio, um, that is what led to Believer. I love that. I mean, you, you, for you, your existence is a form of activism. Activism is sort of woven through everything that you do, um, yeah. it feels like to me. Um, but specifically when you're entering these rooms, how do you try and make that space kind of equitable and safe? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the main thing I try to do and I try to preach to the whole industry is um, it needs to be safe. It needs to be, you know, inclusive and diverse and blah, blah, blah. But like also think about business the truth is always better than a lie it always is so if you're going to be writing a song for a young woman make sure there's another young woman in the room to execute that song especially if the artist is not a lead songwriter you know if they they can contribute they co-write great but if they are the lead writer there should be someone else in that room who has gone through that experience um or at least can understand it better if i'm writing songs with and for people who have led very different lives than i did by just who how they were born i want to fill that room with people who can understand the experience better because it's going to be a better song i love that well i feel like i've covered a lot of ground do you have anything else you'd like to talk about have i missed anything no i would just like to say like any aspiring songwriters or producers, but songwriters are obviously my heart listening to this. Um, I know it's such a weird mystery of like, how do you do this job and how do you get into this job? Um, I don't know is the answer, but what I can tell you is just write as many songs with as many different people as possible because collaboration, will change your life. Even if you decide that you hate co-writing, you will learn about your strengths while co-writing. You will can make your weaknesses stronger by working by seeing how other people do it, that that's why there's no answer. My way in was being in a crazy glam punk band wearing no pants on stage. You just have to fucking do it. Like that's how you get in, is do as much of it as possible with as many people as possible. Um, 
and that's the way in. Well, Justin, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. And I didn't even have to leave my house. How perfect. <laughs>